Our next speaker this morning is Neil Chapman. Neil is the Nature Conservancy's Northern Arizona Program Restoration Manager based in Flagstaff, Arizona. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna go through a couple slides here and try to set the stage a little bit and then, uh, and then tell you what I'm gonna tell you. Um, so uh, restoring Arizona's forests uh, is a big deal. You've heard from quite a few of us already, so I'm going to assume you remember everything that everybody's already told you, Dick Fleischman, uh, Diane Vosick, Spencer Plum, uh, a lot of the stuff on the San Carlos relates to this as well. So uh, I wanted to show a picture that wasn't the Mountain West. I uh, came to the Nature Conservancy through the Illinois chapter. And so a lot of my, uh, my passion and my background evolved in conservation around uh, tall grass prairie restoration. And I think uh, it's applicable because so much of what we've been hearing is our forests really were grasslands. And we're trying to get back to managing this understory instead of the overstory. Um, so really, you know, I think a lot of us need to think of ourselves as grassland managers and not forest managers, but that freaks everybody out because you go to school for forestry, you know? So, uh, <laughs> um, so this is Nature Conservancy's uh, conservation by design framework. This is, uh, you know, how we, we say we do our decision making. Um, we've evolved greatly over time. We've been around about 65 years. Started it as a land trust organization. Everybody knows, oh, Nature Conservancy, they're the guys that buy land. Well, we can't buy enough land in Arizona to fix our forest. So that's not a solution to, to solve uh, our, our problems. So we, we work through these frameworks. And what's really new is this uh, society in nature. You know, we're really trying to to look at how we invest in nature. And it's uh, an exciting change. And this is really where I feel like I get my personal return on investment with our organization. You, we, we talk about our donors return on their investment. If they wanna help fix Arizona's forests, we've got a pretty good package for them to, to buy into. But personally, this is a lot of the stuff why I really enjoy working for the Nature Conservancy. Um, you know, we envision a world where the diversity of life thrives and people act to conserve nature for its own sake and its ability to fulfill our needs and enrich our lives. Um, natural solutions, that's really the, the directions that we're going. So um, Northern Arizona, um, here's a historic photo of uh, Ponderosa Pine Forests. Um, fire suppression and heavy logging started pretty early for us. Um, it's been home to coniferous forests since the, the mid-Pleistocene. Uh, we've had our ponderosa pine forest for about 11,000 years, so this thing's been functioning along quite well until we started altering it. Um, we get into this old tree spaced in groups and clumps with big interspaces. Uh, successful era of fire suppression there, um, very successful. Um, Northern Arizona's forests supply 30% of water to the Phoenix area, so big watershed value. Um, we often think about who benefits from our healthy forests? And it's not just the people who live in Flagstaff or the people who go hunting in the White Mountains. There's insurance companies that are benefiting from healthy forests. There's utility companies benefiting from healthy forests. It's a big deal. Uh, second home values in Flagstaff. I mean, if we didn't have a beautiful forest, half of our economy in Flagstaff is going to disappear. So uh, how did we get to where we are? These are, are some more of these cool historic photos, um, 1875 to 2004. Drastic change. We went from savanna and grassland to closed canopy forest. Um, here's another one. This is right near the Nature Conservancy's Heartbury Preserve uh, in Flagstaff. Um, it's hard to see, but there's the top of Fern Mountain right there, and again right there. So in uh, in a lot of areas, it's not just thin the forest; it's remove the forest. Um, and so that led to these problems. So. Uh, these three slides I'm gonna show were over $300 million in, in costs. So, Rodeo Chetiskai, Schultz fire. Um, Diane went into this on costs. This is the fire, this is the neighborhood. This is the highway that's the only way to go north out of Flagstaff. And, uh, and that highway on the, the east side of the peaks there just got blown out. Uh, major transportation corridor between Flagstaff and Page. Um, Big deal, lots of costs, totally avoidable, um, didn't need to happen. Wallow fire, so uh, you know, that's, that's not what we want. Um, 72 structures lost, $109 million. So healthy forest, fire adapted. Um, th this is something we, 
as stakeholders and collaborative groups, we, we go back and forth a lot, but, um, but we don't really argue on the fundamental concepts. We need to remove trees and we need it to be fire adapted. So we've moved past a lot of the era of uh, groups coming to the table saying, don't, let it, don't cut it, let it burn down. We don't get a lot of that. There's a few outliers that plug in with some of those ideas, but uh, they're not so influential. Um, so a healthy forest fire adapted. Um, we've been studying this stuff for a long time. In 1888, C. Hart Merriam set up a base camp on the San Francisco peaks and started categorizing habitats based on elevations and being able to predict those across landscapes. He was uh, in the 1880s, I joke, he was like our first NEPA planner. Um, 1898, one million acres of the San Francisco peaks were protected. It was called the, the San Francisco Peaks, San Francisco Mountains Forest Reserve. 1898, we're protecting these landscapes. 1908, Fort Valley Experimental Forest right outside of Flagstaff is created. The Reardon brothers that ran the mill in Flagstaff in early 1900s had already realized we're cutting a whole lot of trees and they don't seem to be growing so fast. They knew Gifford Pinchot. They, uh, they reached out to him. Gifford Pinchot and Teddy Roosevelt created the experimental forest in Flagstaff because we knew we were altering the landscape. And so um, th this didn't come as a surprise recently somehow. Uh, 1936, uh, Long Valley Experimental Forest in a little different soil type uh, across the rim ways was created. 1937, Tree Ring Laboratory at ASU in 1937. Um, 1975, Dr. Wally Covington joins NAU and in 1996 created the Ecological Restoration Institute. Um, so we have this, this huge history of science right there at our doorstep that we're trying to implement across the landscape. Um, but again, heavy logging, heavy grazing. We're relatively flat in northern Arizona compared to those beautiful mountains in Washington. Um, that means we had you know, horses and, and crosscut saws working very effectively across our landscape. Spur lines off the railroads were in there early. So um, you know, fire suppression and logging wasn't a, a World War II era thing. This was you know, 1900, this stuff was happening out there. Okay, so, oh, my slide altered. So the, uh, this is what I'm gonna talk about. This is our future forest project, transforming the way forests are managed by bringing together strategic partnerships, new technology, and new business practices. Um, we're looking for solutions that address the problem at the scale that we need to work with. And so here, oh, here's our forest. This is mostly four fry right here with this little patch. There's the North Kaibab and the mountains on the Navajo Reservation. Those are not part of four fry but all this stuff is. And then uh, Dee's land is, is down in here on the San Carlos. And, and uh, one thing to notice is these, these are our rivers, the Verde and the Salt, that go right down to Phoenix, and they drain out of these areas. Stuff that drains out the north side here ends up going into the Little Colorado, which goes in the Colorado, which goes to Phoenix and Tucson anyways. So if you live in the west, <laughs> you're getting your water from a forest. Um, and so when we talk about you know, problems at scale, this is a problem in a lot of places. And, uh, and we need a lot more investment in this from our communities. So our, uh, our master stewardship agreement is uh, relatively new. Our digital restoration guide we've been working on for a couple of years. We've got a partnership with the Forest Service Technology Development Center on a machine vision system, our preserve, and the fire learning network. And so these five things are, are what I'll run through here. So our stewardship agreement, this is, uh, this is big, this is scary. We're gonna be in charge of things now. We're not just you know, going to meetings. And, uh, and so we are going to assume thinning operations across about 20,000 acres. Dick Fleischman has been a huge part of this, the Four Fry team. Um, the, the west side of Four Fry, you've heard us talk a little bit about some of the industry issues. Well, um, the stewardship agreement is, is our mechanism to put skin in the game, control some, some issues, and, and try to transform things. And so the stewardship agreement, um, you know, strategic partnerships are a big part of it. This technology, rules and guidelines, all this stuff is great, but if we don't find a way to implement it and test all this stuff in, in controlled ways, we won't really know how effective it is or what we need to change. So um, stewardship agreement needs strategic partnerships. Um, so Diane threw this slide up earlier, but again, you can see how we've got all these different products that we need to utilize. So Nature Conservancy, Forest Service, Campbell Global is a, is a legitimate timber management company. You know, they're, they're not a fly-by-night logger that got a little bit of financing and built a mill. And, and uh, you know, they, they really are working with us on these complex models. They understand markets. So they're our agent. We have hired them to, to oversee our logging operations. Um, and then local loggers, we're plugging into this. Um, New Pack Fiber is a mill that is um, in very bad financial situations. And uh, they had no long-term supply. They, they were you know, out of options on getting more financing. 
and we're able to come to them and say, hey, 20,000 acres, four to five years, tell us how that could help you guys work this out. And, uh, and suddenly they're, you know, TNC is their savior. Um, and so we're able to provide them opportunities to get more capital. We're able to give them assurances. And, uh, and this 20,000 acres, I mean, four or 5,000 acres a year is not going to fix our forest. But if this works with one mill, we can expand this and scale it up, um, provide more certainty. NAU ERI are plugged in with research. Salt River Project is a, a water utility. Um, they are an electrical utility. They're going to actually be taking some of our biomass and burning it through a, a coal, a coal firing facility and testing this co-firing with biomass and coal. Uh, of course, the county groups are, are a huge part to, to move this stuff along. And we've actually been able to test some of our, um, technology with, uh, Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management. So, um, the message here is it takes a village. Nobody can do this by themselves. The Forest Service is not the problem. They are the solution. But again, they cannot do this stuff by themselves. In Arizona, we often hear this, um, how can we get the Forest Service out of the way? You know, that, that's a whole different discussion. Um, but in our mind, the Forest Service is not the problem. They are the solution. We're creating opportunities to empower private sector, Forest Service, and that's the way we're going to get through these things. So, um, Modernizing business practices. This is, a, this is a tough one because there's a lot of history of very successful business practices within the agency for putting valuable trees from the woods onto a truck to a mill and then into our stores. That's not so efficient when we're cutting these tiny little trees and trying to do restoration. Um, so, you know, you've heard from a few folks about the, the delays in getting things done and going from NEPA to logs on a truck. Um, some of the things that we're learning through the development of our master stewardship agreements, SPAs, the supplemental project agreements, are these same things that either the Forest Service has been running into and we just didn't really notice, or the loggers have these same problems, but they didn't have a clear way to communicate this stuff. Um, so some of the changes we look at is uh, better utilization of spatial data, you know, better utilizing LIDAR. We have all this, I mean, we fly LIDAR in places and then we don't really know what to do with it. There, it's this emerging thing. How do we better invest in utilizing LIDAR? Um, you know, road work as part of logging contracts can be helpful and hurtful. And there's times where can we pull out road packages and have that be a service contract completely independent of cutting trees. Um, Contract preparations, we ran into a scenario where the contracting officer on the Coconino had a limit on the CCF they can sign off on. And that made some of our project, not a, an overall limit, but a per project limit. And so that meant that some of our spas had to be broken up into two separate projects. And that meant our roads packages had to be broken up. Well, which one includes the initial blade? Which one includes the final blade? It's the same road for two separate spas now, just because somebody can only sign for 30,000 CCF instead of 40. Um, Flexibility, you know, um, cut units. There, there's rules about not having too many cut units open, which really are to manage risk. And so the loggers don't get in over their head or partially cut things. But um, in some of these projects, you know, we're, we're trying to push the envelope a little bit and, and remove some of the risk to the logger by providing assurances. So can the Nature Conservancy be in a position where we can have multiple cut units open within the same project instead of just two or three? Um, Temporary road closure authority. This is a big deal around something like the, the C.C. Craig and Reservoir that Spencer mentioned. There's one road in and out of that place. And in the summertime, it's a zoo. And if we want to get log trucks out of there, we can't be having people coming in trying to get to their canoe at the same time. And, uh, and the reality is to protect that reservoir, we may need to take a year or more where people can't drive in and out of there. And, uh, and for a lot of folks, that's crazy talk. And so how can we communicate that you know, we need to prioritize this restoration, and that means you might not get to your favorite places for a little while. Um, and then, in reality, the, the, the issue that we can't export logs unless you're on the Tongass. You know, is there an, if there's a market where somebody in China wants to buy our logs, why are we letting that stop us somehow? You know, I, they can buy our lumber, but what if they just want the log? And, uh, and so looking into some of these export issues. So our, our technology um, really grew out of this idea that leaf tree marking is expensive and four fry is big. And um, we're talking uh, at least $20 an acre for a million acres. There's $20 million in paint. You put in the, the labor cost, you can exceed $75 million. That's not sitting in a drawer waiting for us to get to it somehow when we need it. Um, so moving uh, to designation by prescription, where we're not painting the trees, um, we're still painting boundaries which often is, it's a road. You know, I understand if it's a complex boundary, but if it's a road, do we need paint on one side of the road? 
I think loggers can tell most of the time. Um, so uh, not always, but most of the time. And so, um, you know, really looking at these innovative ways to utilize new technologies around this, this issue. Um, there, there's not a lot of wiggle room. If a logger doesn't have paint on the trees and they're slowing down, they're quickly getting into the red instead of staying in the black. So how can we empower this guy and this machine to do complex prescriptions without uh, Without, uh, without slowing down. So, oh, I'm so sorry it's, it's doing that, but uh, it's a good idea of what a, a guy in a cab is looking at. And uh, in, in this minute long video, he's cutting about 12 trees, and um, they're not very large. You know, that's, that's a $300,000 plus machine cutting trees that uh, have very, very little value. Um, so how can this guy in the cab, while he's doing this, with no paint on the trees, create this complex structure that we're expecting them to do? It goes against human nature a little bit. In reality, we want to make patterns across the landscape. Um, we want, you know, heterogeneity. We want openings, we want clumps, um, and we want diversity of size classes. So how can we better empower this guy running this machine to do things that is sort of against what our natural instincts are? So we came up with this, uh, digital prescription process, working very closely with the Forest Service. This isn't just something TNC came up with and then just dropped on them. This was very collaboratively developed. So um, instead of a, a cutting guide that's, you know, four or five pages or, or just something pretty complex, um, we went out with iPads and we created this. And uh, early on, we just looked at deferrals. Um, we looked at polygons with a diameter limit, so a thin from below. Um, we're still evolving this. We're looking at what other polygons can make sense to a logger that we can then also analyze quickly and easily. So for sale administration tools, but is that spacing? Is it basal area? Is it a VSS stage? Is, uh, is it just cut or select? You know, go into this polygon and do good work and, uh, and leave desirable trees. We have a very good description of what desirable trees are and leave them across an age spectrum. These, uh, these inner spaces, so where there's no polygon, everything in there gets cut except for old growth. Um, and so that's, you know, our guidelines. It could be large trees. There could be the occasional spacing guideline of leave one tree if there's not anything old in those areas. But in general, this will be, you know, that term, our fire fetches, where the fire stays on the ground. And then the polygons are where we are leaving trees across the landscape. Um, and then we can add qualifiers to the map so a logger would actually see, you know, A, B, or C, or the diameter, or some sort of feature to it. Um, we're looking at somewhere around 40 to potentially 60 acres per day in productivity doing the iPads. We're looking at eight acres a day using paint. Um, so we, we know this is gonna cut costs extremely, um, significantly if we can actually get these polygons on the ground and working for the logger. Um, it is a communication tool. So we're changing how a Sylvie goes to a paint crew to a logger. We are now saying Sylvie, marking crew, logger, but we're not using paint. And so we're still walking the ground. This isn't an exercise in GIS in the office. This is ground truth, prescription communication. Um, we've got a great workflow lined out. So we, uh, we have Forest Service staff in, in all kinds of regions. We can email them this info and say, here's how your home unit sets up your database. You talk to your GIS guy, you get this information. Um, so it, it goes really well. We're able to share it across, across units. So we've got, a, we've got a guy in a cab. How do we give him that map? There's multiple in-cab mapping systems. You can use your phone with the Venza PDF maps, but we want to try to do something a little better than that. Um, so Timber Guide is one system we've been testing. Um, it's integrated there to the, to the Feller Buncher's joystick as well. Um, Timber Navi is another one. So basically, every time they cut a tree, we're getting a GPS point. And so here's our map of harvested trees. Um, here you can see they really rip through the inner space, and they pay a little more attention to these groups. And that's the, where uh, these are areas where they're gaining in their productivity. And then these are areas where we want them to slow down and pay attention. This is where we have structure. We want you to think about it. These are areas where we don't have structure. We want you to go fast. Um, so communication tool, there's an administrator in the logger looking at the forest, looking at the screen, sharing information. The logger is getting productivity info. So we're, uh, we're modernizing the, the old process of going in the woods and cutting trees. And so if... Um, if we can actually get this, this whole system aligned and we get it where we have LIDAR, we're getting this harvested tree data. Um, we're also working on trying to get size of harvested tree data plugged into that as well. Then we can take something like a LIDAR point cloud. We can overlay our harvested tree data 
and then we can say those trees are gone and reformulate the thing. And then we can track what our loggers are actually doing across 50,000 acres a year without having to go out and do complex plots. Um, so here's a, both an implementation monitoring tool. So if we get this going at speed, we can go out and say, here's what you did last week. Here's the maps. Here's the data. We can also look across landscapes and say, here's the structure changes we're making at scale. Um, Forest Service Technology Development Center that we're plugged in with, they, uh, they are working on this machine vision system. So again, sorry, it's a little jumpy. Um, but the idea is if we had a stereo camera set up either on a machine or on a cruise, that's somebody's out there doing a cruise, we can start to locate the, every single tree and the size of that tree across the landscape. Um, we're, we kind of have a shotgun approach on some of these technologies where we know some of these will work out well, we'll have to change them. We know, um, you know, get a bunch of hands out there right now and see what we can grab onto that works. Um, this was originally designed for a concept of putting on a feller buncher, and then we, we started working on it a little more, and it's like, well, this might be a really good tool for potentially ground-truthing LIDAR. It could be a really good tool for, you know, instead of doing plots on the ground, they could be walking around with this little stereo camera set up and tracking all this information. So here's a tool that we designed originally for some sort of machine operation that could potentially be used for, for other, other tools or other, uh, other opportunities. Um, within our, um, our stewardship agreement, we're really focusing on more science. And so working with, uh, with Teki Sankey and her lab on the snowpack study, trying to figure out our clumpy, groupy style of forest, what sort of water yield and soil moisture increases are we going to see in that? Um, better understanding our snowpack dynamics. And, uh, and so that's Techie, and she's both got a fixed wing drone and that, that octocopter. Um, she's got some really cool stuff going over at NAU. So uh, Hart Prairie Preserve, this is uh, old school nature conservancy. It's our piece of private land where we're doing things, uh, we're learning things, where um, we thinned 70 acres in partnership with the Forest Service, a meadow restoration. We left one tree on 70 acres. So. Uh, <laughs> Here's the old meadow boundary, and uh, you know, here's the, what, what grew in with fire suppression, and, uh, and so we do the water monitoring. And uh, when I left Flagstaff, uh, our creek was still flowing after August for the first time in the 11 years I've been there. And uh, I can't say it's just because we cut all these trees, but we didn't break any record winter snowpacks or record monsoon season rains in the last 11 years, just this last year. So I think we're having a good impact with our meadow restorations up there and understanding our water yield and our water recharge. Um, some of the issues around paint we learned through this project. Um, and so working with boots on the ground, getting to know the timber staff, we started to learn more about D by P. And when we went to the Forest Service and said, we've got some ideas, we're gonna need you to give us marking crew staff to go test out this idea, they were in a position to say, that's okay, we know you guys, nobody's gonna yell at me for working with you on this, even though it's not a priority in anybody's work plan at this point. And then uh, prescribed fire training exchanges. We need to have a big circle right here. And so we do these all over the country, and, uh, and these training exchanges are, are wonderful. If you, if you get online and Google prescribed fire training exchange, you'll find this good information. These uh, training exchanges, really are the tool to start this culture shift from firefighters to fire managers. Fire is a tool we should be utilizing, not fighting. And so understanding that this is a skill set evolution across a very large agency. And our fire staff do an amazing job with the work they're doing in suppression. But we need to start thinking about what's next. If we get these forests restored, we're still going to be doing suppression, but we're going to be a whole lot more time spent on managing. And, uh, and so these prescribed fire training exchanges get people out of that world of suppression and into this world of management and science and doing good fire instead of bad fire. So um, where do all these things sort of fall together? We've got forest service practices and economics, harvester practices and economics, desired conditions. And we really gotta make all these things overlay, uh, overlay each other. So we've got forest service practices and economics around sale prep, layout, monitoring. Um, we've got harvester practices as far as hitting desired conditions in D by P and mill infrastructures. And our future forest is really where we see all these things fitting together in place right there. Um, and so that, that's really inspiring on, our, on my end to, to think of this is our goal. We, we aren't just picking one side of the problem. We're really trying to get all these things and all these people put in together. Um, so I think I'm... Is that a good time? Okay. So this is, uh, this is the view from our porch at Hart Prairie Preserve. If you're ever traveling through northern Arizona, um, not in the winter, come give us a call and, and come visit our place. It's a, a beautiful homestead with a, a beautiful piece of land. 
It's um, one of the nicest pieces of private land in the state of Arizona, but there's not a whole lot of private land in the state of Arizona. So, um, but uh, seriously, give us a call if you're in the area to come visit, and, uh, and we, we enjoy hosting folks up there. So thank you very much. Right, we, uh, I, oh, so, um, so in cab systems, um, how, I guess, how, uh, what options do we, are we looking at for in cab systems? Is that a good, so um, I, I have a long term vision where we could actually have like a LIDAR image being processed in real time. And it's got all the stand dynamics plugged in. So we know whatever metrics we need to know that the logger needs to know. And then every time the logger cuts a tree, it recalculates that stuff for that cut unit and gives them an updated formula. So if the contract is based on, you know, create a range of group sizes and leave a residual basal area, we could do that. Right now it takes us a whole lot of time in the office, but could we do that in real time in a machine somehow? And so right now all it's doing is putting, uh, we put an aerial image with whatever GIS data we need to put on there, roads, layers, something. And then uh, when they cut a tree, it puts a little point on the map. Um, but then it gets complicated because one system, the map is always facing north, but as the machine's driving around, he's like, well, can't I have it turn as I'm going around? And then we do that, but the machine turns so much, then he's getting dizzy in the machine, you know? And, um, and then they want to zoom in and out, and, you know, here's a system designed for a 50 megabyte map, and we're trying to put a 400 megabyte map in there, and it's freezing up on them. So then we need a new processing system in the tablet. Well, nobody else is asking them for one, so we got to pay for it. Um, so it's... Uh, you know, the, the big picture really is there's been a lack of industry investment in technology based on restoration. Everything's focused on resource extraction, mining, agriculture, you know, commercial forestry. Um, they've got a lot of this stuff in place. I mean, what, John Deere harvester for corn, you, you don't even need to be driving that anymore. Isn't that all like, you know, radio work? And, and so how can we start applying this stuff effectively for restoration where the, the tree value isn't there to pay for it? That's where partnerships and, and uh, strategic partnerships really come into play.